So is this the first time we've recorded in South Dakota? Yeah, I think so. Does it sound all right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, could you turn my mic up just a little bit? Yeah, okay. There's just, just, we're in my headphones there. Oh, yeah. It's always different when someone else is set up, you know what I mean? Yeah, it smells different. You don't have all your cleaning products there. That's right. I mean, they make your smell profile of your home to make you feel comfortable. I thought it was really interesting. Like, man, you've got a really professional microphone boom set up here, and then I moved it, and then it... <laughs> It's like sounds from a horror movie. <laughs> that's that's right before everything twists upside down and the thing comes out yeah, of the dark. Yeah, 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 yeah it's pretty. Bad. No, it's very interesting to be in a different location recording stuff. Got a bunch of cool books in the room, art. There's a lot of history stuff in this room. There's a uh, there's a helmet over there. Like a is that a Roman helmet? What is that? Yeah, it's a Roman helmet. I used it in a Babylonian skit, but it's a Roman helmet. <laughs> I see a sword. That's like a big sword, man. It's got it's got like a side sword, like a Darth Maul, like pointy things on the sides. What oh is, yeah, yeah. What I is see that? What you're talking about? Okay, hang on a second. I'm gonna grab it. I w- just, just you, wait right there. You don't have to grab it. No, it's not gonna be right if I don't get the sword for it. Like you asked me about a sword, and I'm not gonna put it in your hand. It's, this is what kind of host? It's do you think it's a podcast. Nobody can see the sword that you're. They can feel your whoa. <laughs> yeah. Golly, I can't imagine being in battle with that. Yeah, somebody might call that sword compensatory. I don't know what that means. Oh, it's I see. Yeah, I got it. Okay. But it's it's not. It's, I mean, it's it just... looks like in the hilt here, it's got like brass knuckles on the side. Yeah. So this is just for okay. This is just for swinging really really hard. Well, you'd think so, right? So what you're holding there is... It's not stabby. That's a claymore. This is a claymore? That's a Scottish claymore. Yeah. So it's got a huge cross-shaped hilt there at the bottom. Yeah. But as you observed, it's got that Kylo Ren... I don't even know what do you call it. I mean, that was kind of a hilt on the Kylo Ren lightsaber. But this isn't. It's a, a second hand position. So grab that, whichever hand is comfortable. There Whoa, you go. it is a second. It's like yeah. a. Yeah. So those stabby things coming off the side. Okay. That is like a second hilt for when you're swinging it like an axe. No, no. I mean, the, if you're swinging of, it, you're just swinging it with two hands. It's a two handed claymore. So you would just grip that all below the hilt. There you go. Okay. But what this is is for is a secondary function. That's to create a. A phalanx, a spear hedge, a short spear hedge. So what you can do, hand me that thing back real quick. You, you, normally when you hand somebody a knife, you hand them the dole in, but I have to rotate this around the entire room to get it back to you. So check this out. Right now, I'm taking this four and a half foot claymore, and I'm putting the hilt, the ball at the very bottom of the sword, I'm putting it in the pocket of my right foot, the arch of my right foot. You see that? On the ground, see yes. that just sits in there? Yeah. Now what I'm doing, I'm going to move away from the mic a little bit. What I'm going to do. Oh, you, you're you sitting down on the ground, and you're pointing it up so you can kill a horse. That's right. So the guy behind me can use his shield to protect me from archer fire, any kind of projectiles. And I can go underneath. I'm just at the knees. I'm below the dude, the, the guy behind me who's swinging. And what I'm creating is a hedge. This enables us to move forward in increments. Take a little ground. Take a little ground all using our foot to brace this and create a short version of a phalanx. You remember what a phalanx formation is, right? Yeah, where you've got a person in the front line holding the spear and a person behind them holding the spear as well. Like, and they're they're kind of like doubled up, yeah, pointy, stabby things. It's a hedgehog. Okay. And you'd normally go with much longer spears. I mean, this is what the Greeks did. We talked about that a while back. And this is what the Scots famously did at the Battle of Stirling, the Battle of Bannockburn. They made real long pokey sticks to shut down the English heavy cavalry. They had armored knights, armored horses. And the idea was, well, let's just not let them get near our Highlanders and we'll keep them away. So the claymore is reflective. It's a dual purpose sword. It has a defensive function here when I brace it against my foot to create a hedge. And it has a vicious hacking function when I go with this wide grip and swing it overhead or three quarter arm. That's what you're looking at. I don't know that I like it. That's hurtful. Well, <laughs> I mean, if you think about it... Well, no, I meant the sword is hurtful. Oh, would you also have a short sword? Yeah, you'd have what's called a dirk. So those Highlanders... So, for example, I got married uh, in a kilt, and this sword was at my wedding, as a matter of fact. 
But I also had a little ceremonial dirk in my sock. So you got those tall socks, like a baseball uh, stirrup almost. Yeah. And there's a blade in there as well. And that is for getting up and underneath a shield or up and underneath a jaw. It's a shank, Matt. It's just a call, shank. It's, okay, it's called a call shank. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, a dagger or dirk or both would be part of the the repertoire of a medieval Scottish warrior. So that's what I've got here. Kind of cool. My parents gave it to me for graduation. Interesting. Yeah, I still have it. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd want to fight with it. Me- meaning I would not want that to be the weapon I was wielding because it's so big and cumbersome. And frankly, the rotational inertia is just so big. Okay, talk to me more about that rotational inertia of you the can- swing, you mean? If you're coming at me and I got one of those things, I get one swing. If I miss on one swing, I might as well just tornado at that point because <laughs> I can't stop it. That's going to be so bad for your neighbors. Like the exact opposite of the Spartans. We stand by each other. We protect our fellow man. Except for that guy. He just has a huge sword. He just spins in circles. He just spins. We stand as far from him as possible. Everyone, Tasmanian Devil Formation. <laughs> tornado attack. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, I don't know, man. I just, I just don't think that's what I would want to fight with. What would you want to fight with? I mean, war sucks. I, I, I wouldn't want a, a Barrett fifty caliber sniper. No, no, rifle. no, 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 no. You, you knew I wasn't going to accept that answer. No, no gunpowder. It's disallowed. Okay. You are at the Battle of Agincourt in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. Okay. And you are trying to settle the fate of really nothing, just what king or duke gets to say they own what yeah. little chunk of ground. Right. Your life as a peasant part-time warrior will really be unaffected. It's not going to matter to you at all, ultimately, but yeah. you might have to die for this. Just trust me, it's for God or king or something. So anyways, you're totally committed to this fight, and you have to be in it, but there's no gunpowder. It's 14th century. What do you want? We and, know we know the answer to this question. It's Agincourt. You use the the British longbow. Nunchucks. Oh, yep. British longbow. I mean, that's what won Agincourt, right? Yeah, or a Welsh longbow. Seriously, you remember that? What do you mean? Do I, I Why am I even here? I knew that before I knew you. Yeah, I mean, you just like I kind of remember basic algebra, sort of from ninth grade, and that's like, literally all I bring to your topics. And then we get into my stuff, and you just like, all right, you, you just pretend that you've never heard of Agincourt. That's or, not true. <laughs> I mean, you know a ton about all this stuff. <laughs> no, you I, do great. I, that's the point. Nice job knowing. Oh, very good. So Agincourt, I would use a longbow because of you know we could we could knock down the French before they could get to us because they got. Let's be clear: the crossbows they have are neat. They're very neat. But they can't get in close enough to us because we're already well said knocking them down. However, okay, let's say I was a peasant. Okay, in the are fall. we still at Agincourt? Uh, no, let's go to like the next day or Crazy. something. Crazy, yeah, the Battle of Crazy. So here's here's the problem with Agincourt. It was a big swampy mess. It was like Woodstock, and so all the people who had big weapons like this, they couldn't get around. They couldn't handle it's tornado artillery yeah, it's fire. Yeah, they it, yeah, they just got rocked. It nullified <laughs> all movement abilities. All movement modifiers on the board were just zeroed. Yeah. And so obviously artillery or light infantry with arrows, it's going to win the day. So forget that. Let's say we're meeting on clean, open ground, and we're just going to have a good old-fashioned medieval beatdown. Now what weapon do you want? A pike. Tell me more. So I went to... First of all, what is a pike? Yeah. So so I, I went to this village in Germany one time with my wife, and I forget, I, I want to say it starts with an R. But there's this village, it's like an old village, and they keep it, you know, and, and they've got the town crier kind of guy that you pay what? him, and he gives you a, a tour in English, right, because... Does he have a bell? Uh, no, uh, no, but but I, I don't know, but he, he went into this whole long talk about a pike, and how a pike is a big stick... And it looks like an axe on the top, but it has a spear point at the top. Imagine an axe with like hooks on the bottom and then a spearhead out the top. And the idea was dudes are coming at you with horses. You can stick them with a spear side or if they're running past you, you flip around. You can reach up and you can hook them with the bottom part of the pike. Yeah. And you can pull them off their horse. Yes. And they're done. Once you get them on the ground, you win. Yeah. Because you you go to the stabby side of the thing. So a pike was like, as I understand it, it was a huge equalizer between the foot soldier and cavalry. 
I've told you literally everything I know about this. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, I think of a pike as being a very long, very flexible spear, a little bit of wobble to it, right? I picture it having maybe some little spikes coming off of the edges. And my understanding is that the point there is that you don't want to run someone all the way through. This is lovely, by the way. Yeah, this is You great. don't want to run yeah. somebody all the way through with that pike because it was so flexible and so long and you could generate so much power. Now your weapon is three feet out the back of some other dude. And so the idea was having that little crossbar, some little spikes on the top, would, uh, to stop would get it. it in far enough to get things done, but then you're able to retrieve your weapon quickly for additional work. I could be wrong, but I think of a pike as being a lighter, nimbler weapon, whereas a pole arm or a pole axe... Maybe that's what I'm thinking about. Or a pole hook has that little, just little hook on the end, and all it's meant to do is hook into armor or chain mail... It's kind of like what a grappling hook is to a brick wall in a Batman show. A pole hook is to armor. It's just designed to perfectly grab something, anything, and then you can yank that guy off that horse, and then, well, I assume savagery ensues after that. Can we agree yeah. that as a child yes. watching cartoons, I think we've already discussed how incredibly overpowered throwing stars were on oh, cartoons? God. They don't miss. Ever. <laughs> and I remember there was an episode of G.I. Joe I think I've already told you this, maybe even on the podcast. I'm still riveted. It doesn't matter. There, there's an episode of G.I. Joe, and they were against these ninja-type dudes. Yeah. And they're running, and they run inside the door, and they're like, oh, we're safe inside this room. And he shuts the door, and he like he's holding the door shut. And then they're like, what's the matter? Why aren't you talking? And he's like, ugh, ugh. And then he like slides down the door because the throwing stars went through the <gasps> door and killed him. In G.I. Joe? I don't know. Kill people in G.I. Joe? Well, I don't remember what it was then. I just remember, I need throwing stars now. <laughs> well, <laughs> All right, yeah, I do remember talking about this now because we bought throwing stars together in Florida. <laughs> and we lost them. <laughs> I immediately lost mine. I'm going to go out in the backyard and practice my throwing stars. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. see where those went? Uh, Crap, they dug down in the yard somewhere. Kids, be careful out here from now on. <laughs> I don't know what happened to I think those. we literally said that. I still have my nunchucks. They might even still be here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. It wouldn't, yeah. Let's see what there's else. a lot of stuff. Okay, I'm seeing like a bunch of fish things. I'm seeing. Uh, let me see. Hold on. I'm just seeing a lot of cool stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. So, what are we? Uh, what are we going to talk about? Here? Choose your own adventure here, buddy. Because I had one thing that was on my mind, but then you started looking at medieval weaponry. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know what's really fun and interesting? What? Medieval weaponry. Because <laughs> we didn't even talk about that basket hilt one-hand claymore. That's a claymore there. as well? That is a claymore. So this claymore here is from the William Wallace era. That's like 1200s, 1300s, right? This one over here, that's from the Rob Roy era, and more like early modern Scottish heroism. Just before gunpowder. Because mm -hmm. not a little bit of gunpowder in the really? Rob Roy era. Yeah. Man. Yeah. There was gunpowder in play, even the Hundred Years' War kind of era. It was just so useless and untargeted. The Spanish were using it already at that point, but it was just a disaster. Those hip cannons they would try to carry into medieval battle, yeah, it didn't work. Didn't light, blow up their own hips. Well, Leonardo da Vinci actually drew uh, one of the first multi-use guns, if I recall. Really? Yeah, I, I'm going purely on childhood memory here, but I remember, imagine a bunch of pipes. Like, let's say we get 12 pipes, and we lay them out, and those are gun barrels, and we lay them side by side by side. Okay. And then we rotate the thing, like, uh, 120 degrees. Okay. And you build an equilateral triangle out of these rows of pipes. So okay. you, could, you could fire a volley, and then you could roll it, and you could fire another volley, and you can roll it again, and you fire it one more time. Really? Yeah, because they were muzzle lo loaders. I'm not sure if his design was a muzzle loader, but... It was a really hard thing to load weaponry. Well, it had to be a muzzle loader, right? I mean, we're talking. Yeah, Da Vinci was in his prime from 1490 to 1510. Okay, so you're not doing anything but muzzle loading at that point in history. Oh my gosh, dude! We there's so much to talk about there. What do you mean with breech design, for example? A lot of muzzle loading stuff went down in the Civil War. A whole lot. What do you mean by went down? You mean that's still how people loaded their weapons? Yeah, but they were starting to develop breech loading weapons, which was amazing. Isn't the Enfield rifle a breech loader? I don't know. Well, there were some really interesting designs in the Civil War. There, there was cartridges. They were starting to develop brass cartridges. 
there was some really forward thinking for uh, people in the third chair who aren't familiar with firearm and military technology what's the difference between a cartridge and a bullet so the bullet is the slug or the thing that flies out and okay. hit, hits a person the cartridge is the part behind the bullet so if, if you're thinking about a, a cartoon bullet the bullet is usually copper looking or lead or like gray looking and the cartridge is brass typically there are some really interesting new designs coming out. I remember I had to do a, a speech competition at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 2000, what was that, 2002, 2003? Whoa. And you were just a little pup. Yeah, didn't know anything. Yeah. Did you have armpit hair yet? No, I still don't. Did they ask in advance? I literally do not have armpit hair well, right show now. show me. I don't. You have armpit. <gasps> How do you not have armpit? Oh, you got like eight. I shaved it. Why did you shave your armpit hair? I don't know. Occasionally, I do that. I I got real sweaty. How would that? How do we go from that sword to my armpit no, hair? This is your fault. You yeah. didn't have to. I mean, you could have just rolled with the joke and I said could. you pulled up your shirt like a hussy. I just don't understand. I'm just really comfortable in your house here. I, I, I super think. appreciate that. <laughs> so so this guy that I was, uh, it was a speech competition. It was not a debate. It was a speech competition. He was working on a way to make a new military rifle using liquid propellant. And the idea was that, hey, we will use bullets, and we'll just put the bullet in the chamber, and then we'll do two squirts of a liquid propellant and ignite it somehow. I don't remember what the ignition method was. It was a really interesting idea. He ended up winning, if I recall. It was 20 years ago, and I haven't heard more about that. Yeah, there were a ton of reasons why it was a bad idea. Like, a ton of reasons it was a bad idea. Because it shoots bullets so that could hit people? No, not that. It was, oh, wow. Dude, this is a bottomless pit of a conversation between you and I. Okay, well, hold on. Because, I mean, you're talking about logistics. Like, there's yeah. military logistics are fascinating. For example, yeah. in the American military, the Americans are great. And by Americans, I mean us. Really, really good at logistics. Everything is standardized, palletized. For example, a light machine gunner. Uh, right now, it's the M240. They're changing over to a new weapon soon, but right now it's the M240. What was it before that? I want to say M60, long time ago. It's a cruise serve weapon. You got two people typically, but but the 240s a really interesting firearm. Wait, you're saying this is a light, an LMG, this is a light machine gun? I don't want to say the wrong thing. Lee was probably a, a 240 gunner. I think he actually was for a while. So I, I don't know the exact, I just know how, to, how they work. For the uninitiated, we're not talking about a rifle, a we're, battle rifle that a soldier would carry around. And we're, we're talking not, about... We're not talking about a saw, which is like, a, what is it? SAW, squad attack. I don't know what this stands for. It's just a saw. Super awesome Super weapon. awesome weapon. <laughs> Something you use in Contra. But the, the M240 is a heavier machine gun, higher rate of fire. Not as big as the M2, the Mondeus, 50 cal machine gun. But anyway, to my point, logistics-wise... The Americans just have ammo with what's called disintegrating links. I don't know what that means. You open a can of ammunition. Oh, yeah. And then you have a belt. Oh, like a literal physical can. Yeah, okay. a, a belt of ammunition that you pull out, and you fire it from the machine gun, and the links, the part that links one bullet to the next bullet to make the chain of bullets yeah. that can then be mechanically fed into the machine gun, the links for American weapons, both the 50 cal and the, the smaller stuff, they're called disintegrating links, which means when the machine gun feeds in a bullet, it'll fire the bullet, and then it disintegrates. It basically pulls the brass cartridge out of the link, and that breaks the chain, and the chain link falls off. So the action of clearing the cartridge yes. that, for example, in a handgun resets the firing mechanism. Yes. Here, that energy is being repurposed to dispense with the clutter of the links as it's being fed. Which is interesting because the Russians in, in World War II, the Germans, they have non-disintegrating links, which you can reload. So logistically, these are two different philosophies. One of them would say, hey, what we're going to do is we're just going to send a bunch of cans of ammo, and then you just take this and you you wear these things like belts, and you know you have these mental images of these guys in Vietnam wearing these belts of ammo, crossways, almost like suspenders. You know that. Yeah, like rock and roll from GI Joe. Was that his I name? I think that was a guy, right? He was one of the original four or five GI Joe guys. I think he he wore those belts. Okay, like that. Is that yeah, a, like a bandolier. 
I think a bandolier is different. Bandolier, if I understand correctly, that I've never used a bandolier, but you hold stripper clips and bandoliers. Golly, man, I'm I'm over my head. I need to quit talking. I I know how it all works. Yeah, I well, don't, I, I don't know any of the vocabulary. No, that's all right. I, that's never, a, yeah, never talk even, about the stuff you're good at. Never been to basic training. <laughs> yeah, and I've never been in medieval warfare. Yeah, but I spent a whole lot of time studying it in college and grad school and and but, since. But here's what's interesting about the the Russian and the German thought is on the battlefield you can just go pick up the belts mm-hmm. because the belts are contiguous. They are all together, and you can put bullets back on these belts. For example, the th- there's a a couple of really good machine guns that the Russians have made. One of them's called the PKM, I believe. And you may have heard of the German MG42. The really what mm-hmm. what there was a nickname for it is a really really fast one. Oh, is it Hitler's buzzsaw? I don't know. It's that something. It's something crazy. But it has an incredible rate of fire. And then the Russians have another one called the Dishka, which is basically their version of a 50 cal. It's a little bit bigger bullet than a 50 cal. Bigger? But, yeah. Big, Mercy. Yeah, right? But what's so interesting about all those is the Americans are like, hey, put these ammo cans on a pallet, ship them to wherever they need to go, so when it gets to the foxhole or whatever, the guy can open the ammo can and just pull the belt out and put it in his machine gun. Whereas the Russian thought is send these wooden boxes to the front line, and when they get there, they bring out these metal cans that look like sardine cans, but really big. Okay. And then use a can opener, or sometimes they have a little ways built to like rip the metal open, open the bullets, open these paper packs, and then they have this really cool machine that you just dump all these bullets in, and you turn a crank, and you put one of these non-disintegrating belts in one side, and it'll just... And it'll load the belt. Really? They're fascinating. Two very different philosophies. I don't really understand why s- sometimes they make one decision, sometimes they make the other. So it's just really interesting how one decision, for example, that Claymore that's still there on the floor by your feet. Yeah. That's a decision. I mean, a whole army and a whole team of a nation's blacksmiths made decisions. Mm-hmm. And they're like, this is what we're going to do. And then they show up on the battlefield, and they're like, oh, crap, we have crossbows. They have longbows. We made the wrong call. It's like there's a shadow war, and the shadow war is a group of engineers, scientists, technicians, fabricators, and that's what ends up determining what kid speaks what language 200 years Uh, from the day of the battle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg question here. When it comes to weapon design choices, iconic weapons, military strategy, whether you're talking about the stuff that I'm a little more comfortable with, that being ancient, classical, medieval warfare, or the stuff that you're infinitely more informed about being modern warfare. I mean, obviously, I had a bunch of classes about all of that in school as well, and I wrote my papers and I did my work. I just never understood it as well. Once you get past the Civil War, I started to feel overwhelmed by the logistics and the technology, it just became a lot to keep track of. It wasn't as easy for me to say, all right, I understand the human element here and what we do, but acknowledging that we, you know, we both spent a little bit of time thinking about this stuff between the two of us. We cover a decent amount of time that we've spent some time reading about and all of this in terms of the grand scheme of history. There's a chicken or the egg question here, and that is, did the Scots make weapons like this, big, huge, unwieldy, dual-purpose claymores because they wanted their military to fight a certain way or because the psychology and culture of their people was a certain way and that's the weapon that fit what they would naturally do on a battlefield and how they would actually behave under duress, that they would dig in and, and play defense that they would endure the awful rainy weather of the highlands and that they would use these in, it's kind of goofy to think about and picture, but it's the truth. You use these as a, a tent pole to go along with a kilt to provide yourself with shelter in the field. I mean, a, a kilt can be yards and yards and yards of wrapped fabric. Really? Mine has so much fabric, so much more than any human would ever need to just wear. It's not... It's not like somebody just took off a, you know, a towel, a beach towel, and just wrapped it around your waist once. My kilt is massively thick 
and heavy. And it's for formal stuff, so it's all stitched together, but you could easily snip that out and you'd have enough to make a tent. I mean, it's just massive. I kind of feel like this particular weapon design is reflective of who those weapon designers already had to work with and their environment and how they thought and how they would behave under duress on the battlefield. And I suspect that if we went to other people groups, maybe I'm not quite as intimately familiar with, that a lot of the same evolved. These people use these weapons because it fits their enculturation. It fits with their mindset and their approach. Like like what you and I are talking about with Sparta. The whole hoplite phalanx thing, it's not just a military unit. It's a culture. I don't know which came first, the hoplite or the Spartan mentality, but they certainly married together really well. And I bet if we picked away at things in terms of the Russian mentality, the German mentality, the American mentality, the British mentality on making heavy machine guns, you know, uh, machine guns that are on a base and are operated from a, a solid footing, I'm guessing that they would all be reflective of certain cultural values and instinctive battlefield behaviors when under pressure. I think the bigger driver, counterpoint, I don't, I'm not really counterpoint, another point. Okay. I think the bigger driver is what is the enemy using and how do you counter it? What do you mean by that? What do you mean? What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, how does, <laughs> how does a machine gun, I just don't understand right off the top of my head, how the technology of the belt and whether it is disintegrating or not disintegrating on a machine gun has anything to do with what the other person is doing. On an offensive weapon, you're right. Yeah. Uh, good point. On many weapons, I agree with you 100%. Because a lot of what I worked on was defensive. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I'm just programmed to think differently because I'm like, what are they doing to hurt us? How do we defend against that? Yeah. And so I see completely what you're saying. Yeah, I think I'm wrong on that. Okay. But I mean, if we go back to the, the Middle Ages and stuff, you're talking about the halberd or pole hook. Uh, halberd, is that what that's called? No, that's, that's the one that has the big axe head on a very long stick. And it also has the pointy spear point. At the end. Okay, that's what I'm thinking about then. Yeah, that's a halberd. I don't want a pike anymore. I want that. You want that. Okay. Spell that, please. Uh, it's H-A-L-B-E-R-D or B-R-E-D. Halberd or halberd. I'm yes. looking it up. Okay, I have, heard, I have heard that word before. Maybe that's what the German guy said. The name of the town sounds like Rothsburg or something like that. Rat, Ratsburg or... I, I forget the name of it, but it is a really interesting town. It is a halberd, H-A-L-B-E-R-D. I remember seeing one of these at the uh, Chicago Museum of Art of all the weird things. They have a hall of weapons there. Really? Yeah, it was my favorite part, which I'm sure is not what my art teacher wanted my opinion to be. Yeah, let me show you a picture right here. That's a halberd. Is That's that what, what I want. Trying? Yes, okay. I want that. It looks like an axe that mm -hmm. Shredder would carry <laughs> from the Ninja Turtles. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It, it just does. Tall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do a lot with that. So you can adopt that phalanx formation. It's a multi purpose weapon. You can defend against heavy cavalry. The name of the town I'm thinking about is Rothenburg. Ooh. Rothenburg, I think. Yeah. Super cool town. We stayed in a little bed and breakfast. It was early in our marriage and we stayed in like what we could afford. Yeah. You, that's, you know, that's still largely what we do when we travel. You know what I'm trying to say, like yeah. We, when you're, I do. I, when you're, I'm when, giving you crap, but when you're kids, it's uh, it, it's like you. Everything is special. Anything you can get. Anything you can do beyond hamburger helper at your own house. Yeah, yeah. Do those memories mean more to you? Is there something just a unique flavor to that stuff that all happened when you were young, just out of college, in debt, and just dirt poor? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Same here. I remember my wife cooking. <laughs> Uh, there's a place called Warehouse Discount Grocery. Sounds amazing. Yeah, it was not. It sounds it was, so appetizing. And we, we would buy the Benton Dent cans. Two of the three words in the name of that place really sound Warehouse appealing. Warehouse Discount. <laughs> yeah. And then food, food, yeah. Yeah, right at the beginning, I assume we're going somewhere to like meet the buyer for a discreet handoff or something. But then you said grocery at the end. and Yeah, those were good times. Those were good times. It was just a really special visit because I remember, um, you know, when you get to go to a, a new interesting place for the first time. I was there on work and, uh, you know, and I was able to take her, which was a huge deal. We, If we could spring for the 
for her plane ticket, we could get over there. And then we tacked on a couple of extra days and we were able to do a bed and breakfast. But I remember the town because the guy took us around and he explained all these ancient weapons and how the city would defend itself and things like that. And I can remember his punchline for the whole tour. Apparently there was a bar. The name of the bar was synonymous with hell. Oh. He ended his tour right before the part where, you know, you ask for tips as the tour guide. He said something about, now everyone go to hell, is what he, <laughs> is what he said. Oh, that's and I, cute. I remember thinking, that was clever. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. That was clever. But it was, a, it was a really, really interesting thing. Okay, side note. You know, Camilla works with immigrants and teaches yeah. English. Yeah. And it's such a diverse group right now, man. I mean, with the, the war in Ukraine, we have a bunch of Eastern Europeans and people from all over Latin America. And we're, we have an influx right now of people we're getting to know from the Indian subcontinent. It's just a very By the way, diverse time right I, now. I would like to here. compliment you. So one of the things I really wanted to do is go to one of your son's baseball games because I yeah. know you spend a lot of time with that. Yeah. I expected to, you know, walk up and you're like, oh, you know, he's playing and, and we're in the stands just watching. It was really encouraging to show up and see Shane there, good friend. Yeah. And then the few guys that showed up from yeah. Bangladesh. Yeah. The vibe was really cool. So it's some engineering students here in town. Yes. Apparently you guys just hang out. You guys yes. all hang out. And you and you and spend- that's and that's all Shane and his wife Emily. They just decided there is this group of people in the community who don't know anybody because of the rules of studying in the United States from where they're from. They're on a very super hyper limited budget. And Shane and Emily were just like, we should just make their time here fun. Just give them the whole experience. Like, this is what it's like hanging out with a group of friends, a circle of friends in the United States. We play sports. We do things. We tend to cook out all summer long, come to all of our barbecues it's just been awesome getting to know these guys who've jumped in. They're super fun, super smart, all here studying uh, stuff from your field, engineering. So, yeah, that, that's what you're seeing. I, the only credit I can take is that I like them, and it's been nice getting to know them. But Shane and Emily have really built this circle up. It's, it's cool. And how cool was it that uh, one of the guys showed up with a little Tupperware tub of cornbread? Yes. He's like, yeah, I'm just trying to cook, and I made this. I don't know what it is, and I was and he's like, you want to try it? I was like, yeah, and I tried it. I was like, that's cornbread. That's real cornbread. Yeah. He's from the south. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand what that means. Yeah. He's from the south. That's well, the cornbread is it's a lot. You did a great job. The cornbread's good, man. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was so fun. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And I've I've really enjoyed just watching the natural flow of your life, and I've really enjoyed our boys getting to hang out. Yeah, that's been a blast. So yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. It's been fun doing nothing because really we haven't done anything. We're both in the flow of our lives right now. You're finishing off a project and we're just kind of here hanging out and that's fun. And it's been really fun to watch the boys just know what to do. Get on a scooter. Go scoot somewhere. There's a park. Explore it. Yes. There's a neighborhood. Go Go do things. Go feed a dog. Yes. Yes. Later, we will see you. Possibly (laughs) before dark. Yeah. Possibly not. I'm sure it'll go great. And so far, it's gone great. It's been really good. It's been really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you you were saying uh, Camilla works with immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were saying the thing about the guy telling everybody to go to hell. We've got immigrants from from all over the world who Camilla's working with through the Literacy Council here. And she does tutoring for some. She helps to bring on new tutors because the demand is great. So you got to bring on a bunch of new people and train them up. She's doing that in the morning. She was doing a, a conversation class here a couple of weeks ago. These conversation classes are where she gets together a reasonable amount of people where everybody would have the social ability to get in to the conversation. You can't yeah. do this with 50 people. Yeah. And, and the ground rules are, it's just English. And so Camilla speaks Spanish and she could easily just speak Spanish and exclude the Ukrainians or the Bengalis. Do you say Bengali for somebody from Bangladesh? Don't know. I don't know. That's she could exclude demonym. everybody else really easily and get practice, and that would feel good, but she restricts herself. The, the rule is it's all English. It's immersion. You just communicate what you're able to communicate, grunts, hand gestures, drawing, anything. We're just practicing communicating in this country, right? And so the students text her. She's sort of the hub, and so she gets interesting messages from people as they attempt English or use Google Translate from their native tongue. Well, there's a... <laughs> There's a restaurant here called Inferno. That's a wood fire pizza place. Yeah, is it? Does Kobe Bryant? No, who? No, no. Uh, LeBron, LeBron James. LeBron has James. Blaze. Yeah. He has Blaze Pizza. 
Okay. Which is kind of like Subway, but for pizza. Okay. And Inferno is the same thing, just a competing brand. Okay. I, I don't know if anybody famous owns that one. And they're both good. Inferno's good. So Camilla's there for uh, <laughs> some kind of class. I don't know. I, I see where this is going. Class. And uh, <laughs> you do see where it's going. She gets a text, and the text... <laughs> <laughs> the text from this student reads teacher i am in hell and the door is locked <laughs> <laughs> obviously it was a google translator i am at inferno but the door is locked is what the guy was oh Clearly trying yeah. to communicate, but it just it turned Inferno into hell. And I don't know. I don't know what language it was. I don't know who said oh, it. Oh wow! Yeah, it tickled me. <laughs> Dang! Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you respond? To? <laughs> I don't know. You just be a good sport. You know. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's incredible. Yeah, I, I really I really think it's cool what you guys are doing here. You're you're spending a lot of time with people in your community. And more interestingly, with people in your community from other communities, and yeah. you're giving them community. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, how you know? It's a weird way to say it. But the, what you're doing is really, really cool. I don't know why I didn't expect that. Hmm. Because I mean, I know you well enough, and I know how you think, and I know how your family thinks. Camilla is like next level at this sort of thing. You know, serving others. I don't know why I didn't see that coming. But of course, you do that. Of course, that's what you do. I'm riding everybody else's coattails. I really am. I'm in, and I'm excited about the things like that that are going on, but uh, I can't take credit for that. It's easy to be a part of cool things when everybody you're hanging out with is initiating cool things all the time. So it's, yeah. I, I That, that I felt cool like friends. you sticking a Scottish Claymore in the ground and deflecting my blow as I charged <laughs> with, at you with compliments. <laughs> uh, thanks for the nice things you said. I appreciate that. This episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Stamps.com. Matt, can I just read the the offer right up at the top here so people know what ultimately we're, we're hoping they do? Can I do that? Absolutely. Here's what they say. Avoid the hassle and get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with the promo code NDQ for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code NDQ. In DQ. And this is great for, like, if you have a small business or something like that, right? That's the ideal situation. But you can also do this just for your household, correct? Well, yeah, anything graduation announcements, Christmas cards. If you want to stay in touch with people in your life and you don't want it to be digital for a change, I think stamps.com is really useful there. It's a super easy way to handle all of that from home. And like our ancestors used to do, Give people something tangible that they can touch to stay in touch. Ancestors. <laughs> you know it's true, man. Yep. All right. So okay. here's the deal. Uh, postage rates went up again, and stamps.com actually comes with a discount. So you're saving money on the postage side of things. You're saving money on the running around and the hassle side of things. It's simple. It's straightforward. And there's a really cool opening deal. What is that again? What are we doing here, Destin? You go to stamps.com. So basically, if you go to the top right of the page, it's the top of the page. There's a little microphone. If you click on that and you enter the code NDQ, that gets you all the special stuff, which is a four-week trial, free postage, and a free digital scale. As always, thanks to stamps.com for supporting the program. And as always, thanks to you for supporting the sponsors. That really helps make this thing go. Absolutely. Thank you so much for considering it. Like you said at the beginning of our conversation, this is the first time we've ever sat down at these mics at my house in South Dakota. It's a little different. I did have something in mind, but the second you latched on to the weapons, I was like, oh, well, yeah, I've thought for a long time it'd be really cool to do a pre-gunpowder weapon conversation with you and just game it out a little bit. So, hey, great. No, cool. I'm just going with it. I'm saving the other thing I was going to talk about till later. Okay. So there's an outstanding question that you still haven't really answered to my satisfaction. Okay. You've said that the halberd would be your weapon of choice. I assume, though, that would just be for war, right? If you had to have a non-gunpowder weapon and just imagine a different set of morals, a different time, we don't need to suss this out as though it's the mid-2020s or whatever. This is just You're in a different situation where things are a lot harder and sometimes, like say one to two months a year, people just raid. And you might get raided 
and you might get killed because Whoa. that happens. What do you think would be, as a weapons expert, as somebody who specializes in defense and defending things, what would be your choice if you lived in a pre-electronic, pre-industrial revolution, pre-gunpowder era? What would be the thing that you think would be the best weapon for a person to be good at? Mm. I, I'm not going to call myself a weapons expert. I've worked with a lot of them. But, I, I mean, everybody wants to be Legolas, right? Everybody wants to be good with a bow and arrow. But I think a short sword would be really good as well. Like a gladius kind of, is that what it's called? What, yeah. yeah. Gladius, gladius, I, I, I've never known. I think a short sword like Sting in, in Lord mm. of the Rings would be good. That would be very, very interesting because you could carry it around. I guess I'd have a combo, kind of like Link and Zelda. I, I would have a bow with a small quiver and steel-tipped arrows. I would also have a short sword. That's what I would go for. By short sword, you mean like the length of an arm, wrist to shoulder? I mean, if I'm just carrying it all the time, it'd be probably even shorter than that. Just like a little bit smaller or shorter than a machete. You carrying it on your hip or you carrying it over your shoulder, across your back? I don't know, man. I, I, the hip is what I would think, but I, I don't know. So in order to keep that from being an issue as you bend your knee and do daily tasks, that's got to be a way shorter than your kneecap. So a hip to kneecap is how much you got there. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about this. It's interesting. I carry a Leatherman every day. That was actually an issue coming here. I really wanted to bring my Leatherman. You have one? Uh, not on me. What? Yeah, it's in there. I just uh, gave you a Leatherman. It's not a Leatherman. That's that's okay. a multi-tool. Yeah, it's the multi-tool. It's what I had. It's what you had. I have a Leatherman. I appreciate somewhere. you loaning me a multi-tool. It's not the one. You know what I mean? <sighs> I know. After years and years and years, I kind of like honed in on that. That's the one. I used to have a Gerber flick tool. So it's a one-handed operation. You pull it out of the little pouch or the little sheath on your hip, and you can flick it open. And I always thought that was really good. The Leatherman is where I've ended up. It takes a little longer to open the Leatherman, but once you do, you can kind of, I don't know, it's its built tougher, I think, than the old version I used to use. Hmm. But I think the knife that a person chooses to carry says a lot about that person. This is going to be humiliating. <laughs> do you not carry a knife? No, no, just, just round it out, and then we'll get to the shameful part later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember, so I've carried a multi-tool for years, and, and I like the pliers function on the multi-tool and the fact that it has a little screwdriver and stuff. But I remember going rabbit hunting with my, I'm in South Dakota, I said hunting instead of hunting. I felt that. Really? That was weird. You changed it just to accommodate me? If or was I, it an accident? I don't know. I felt it. It was weird. But anyway, I went, went rabbit hunting with Uncle Ronnie. Okay. And in the holler? No, no. Just out in the field. Okay. We killed a rabbit. I shot one with a 20 gauge. And then we were going to skin it. And we went to skin it. And I got my knife out. And he, he checks it. And he pulls it out. And he opens it. And he goes, no, this won't do. I was like, what's wrong with my knife? How old were you? I was pretty young. I was probably 17, okay. 16, 17. He said, this isn't sharp. He said, if you're going to carry a knife, it might as well be a sharp one. And I was like, oh, man. And so he sat there, and he got out his whetstone, and he taught me how to sharpen a knife. Hmm. And then he shaved the hair off his arm. Oh. And he's like, yeah, if you, you're going to carry a knife, you need to carry a sharp one. I was like, man, that's awesome. And I never have a sharp knife. <laughs> oh, man, I really I, thought there was going to be I, a, a better resolution. No, I, I wish I, I wish I had learned that lesson. But uh, I'm the kind of guy that will sharpen a knife every year or so, but I'm not good at it. And so you really have to know what you're doing to do that. And so when I look at that big claymore that's sitting right beside you, it's not sharp. Well, that's on purpose. Well, because it's in your house. Right. If something happens here, I'm going to try to come up with a better strategy for how to defend the home than this weapon that was the weapon of choice for only one people group on Earth for a very limited number of years, primarily during the 13th century. I'm just going to go with, I don't know, anything else. Pro I might reach for the nunchucks first. I'm not kidding. Was it effective? Like, did that sword design and It's style? effective in a group. Did they win battles? Heck yeah. They won battles with that? Yes. I mean, you got hedge trimmers with that. I mean, the, the mess of sword swings that you have going on and you have that defensive capacity and it's pretty handy for logistics because it's tentpole if you need it to be. There were a lot of advantages to this and there's a reason it was popular. How do you carry that? You have to carry that on your back. You can sling it. You can make a, a baldric that it slides into or a leather grip that goes between that little pointy part in the middle that I don't know the name for and the hilt. 
Mm-hmm. So it's, a lot of that will be leather wrapped to make it easier to hold on to or probably like catch the oozing blood of your foes mm-hmm. who you've slain, I would guess. You want to be able to hang on to that. But no, there's like a, a, a baldric, like a sling that theoretically you can you can make for that. I think William Wallace, uh, who was not as nice as the movie Braveheart portrayed, I think I recall a story where he was rumored to have made a baldric for his claymore out of the tanned hide of one of his slain enemies. I don't like that at all. No, I'm against it. But it might have been a really bad guy. Really? I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't like that. You're just not going to do anything that mm-hmm. involves the tanned hide of people? No. It's very, very nice that we live when we do. We don't have to worry about what you said to the extent that, you know... People... <laughs> you won't even say it. I won't, I won't. grossed you out that much. Sorry. No, I mean, we live in a time of unprecedented peace, I think. There are wars going on all the time. I've worked on weapons. There's a lot to it. But if you think about how many people exist versus how many people are fighting at any moment in time, I don't know. Just when you said something about your village will get raided, that that made me, that was scary to me. That is the difference. Yeah. Right there. Your village will get raided. There was just a campaign season back then. And it was just expected. I mean, and back then, what am I even talking about when I say back then? Uh, The classical world through the Middle Ages, especially leading up to the Crusades in the years before the land crisis started to really come into play. I mean, it's no coincidence that the Crusades get started right after the turn of the millennium. And that's also about the same time that if you just go back and I mean, it's like measuring generations of mitosis. When you look at cellular biology or anything like that, it splits, it splits, it splits. You're fine, you're fine, you're fine. But then there's going to be one generation where that split puts you over the critical mass. Like now you've got too much of this particular organic presence in your compound, in your solution, whatever. And so the same thing happened with inheritance and land. So as Rome disintegrated in the 5th century and onward, I mean, there were some later attempts to put it back together, but effectively Rome was coming unglued by the mid-400s. Well, that's what had provided order, and particularly order regarding the distribution of land. Now that there is no more central authority that has the power to enforce what happens with land, it simply comes to down to a matter of Well, if you have a certain amount of land and you can defend it and you have a certain amount of kids, you just give some to all the kids or else what are they going to do with life? I mean, they'll they'll die. It's agrarian in Europe in the first millennium, second half of the first millennium. Well, that's fine for several generations, but you start to get into the 800s and the 900s and about there is where that's just too many generations of kids and now the land is getting too divided up. And this land is getting into such small segments that it can't really support families. So even that subsistence farming thing is, we're struggling to pull that off, let alone the pressures caused by nobility. At this point, you know, just before the Crusades, you've got dukes who rule over a yard. I mean, they don't, they don't have any meaningful land at all. And so... I, I've heard there's a... Well, you've seen the ads on YouTube where you can pay X amount of dollars and somebody will make you a Scottish lord (laughs) or whatever it is. That's fake, (laughs) but yes. It it sounds like a pyramid scheme or something. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, whatever makes people feel good, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, I don't think that actually works, but it's it's a fun idea. Uh, Any more than naming a star after yourself is going to work. Whatever beings live around that star, I don't think you're going to be able to go there someday and be like, hey, I know this sucks. But <laughs> kind my of... name, my name is Jared, <laughs> and the star that you currently call whatever that is you're saying, it's actually called Jared. I paid a guy, <laughs> yeah, and it's named after me. Well, I didn't. So pay I kind of my like, wife you did. Know, it was our third wedding anniversary gift. Kind so. of a big deal. Yeah, for your, your I don't know if you system, guys like Jared have system. religions or know how to worship, but <laughs> I mean. <laughs> So, it would be the Jared system, wouldn't <laughs> that's, it? That's what it is. <laughs> oh, I got it, Jared. So the thing that happened is even the nobility is in crisis because there's just not enough land to support the number of descendants. And then the Crusades come along, and here's an opportunity to release the pressure valve on Europe. These little entities called Crusader states crop up as a result of the Crusades, probably the most famous of which is Odessa. Odessa, Ukraine? Uh, Edessa. Oh, Edessa. And okay. Odessa. They're, but not Odessa, Ukraine. 
And so what happens in these places is just basically this little European style duchy or, or whatever crops up in Turkey or Syria or the Middle East. It's weird. Okay, there's too much here. At some point, I would like to learn about the Crusades because I am totally an ignoramus when it comes to the Crusades. All I know is you're supposed to be able to say, oh, yeah, religion's awful because the Crusades. Am I right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to be able to say that. Yeah. And then you're supposed to be like, oh, yeah, you know what? You're you're absolutely right because of, of that thing that I know nothing about. It is funny. The Puritans and the Crusades are the two things where people buy. It's super puritanical. Just chase that with the following question. Yeah, like the super famous Puritan that we all know the name of. Uh, what was his name? That one name? Any Puritan again? And there's some people in the third chair right now. Listen to this. They're like, I know one, William Blake, or two. <laughs> uh, sure, that sounds like it could be one. But it's one of those things where, yeah, I mean, we don't cover that stuff per se in school, but we're pretty sure we know how it is. The reality is the Puritans, like all people, were a pretty mixed bag. And the Crusades, uh, it was pretty ugly, but also it looked a lot like medieval warfare and kind of things that were going on in the Middle Ages. So uh, it's a mixed bag. It's, It's complicated, like all of history stuff, like how I like Persia some of the time and like Greece some of the time. The Crusades are an interesting cat as well. But the reason that I brought all of that up was just to say, the raiding thing is just what you did in the spring, and especially in the Middle Ages. You'd go and try to gather resources from somebody else without having to till the soil yourself. And this moved around boundaries from time to time, and you had to get your blessing to go and raid. So if you had to defend a little farm or something like this, do you want a halberd? What would you use? You can have anything. You have a katana, throwing stars. Um... I'm still thinking bow bow and arrow because... And the short sword. And the short sword. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to go up against somebody that can wield that claymore in any kind of effective way. I'm just not going to be able to physically. So I think that's why guns are such a big deal. They... (laughs) What is the saying about Samuel Colt? God created man, Samuel Colt made Made them them equal. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting. So like a little granny, I, I can remember my granny sleeping with a 38 special under her pillow. I don't want to tangle with her. And I remember going in there and being like, granny, there's what? what is this pistol doing in here? She's like, well, you never know. No, like, but granny, like you, you go to sleep at night in this bed. <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> so, so, but I, I do think it's, it's fascinating that democratizing violence mm-hmm. has mm-hmm. brought more peace. It's interesting. Yeah. And I think that'd be another fascinating thing to run down is how do we quantify that? Or is it more peaceful now? Is it less? I mean, it's certainly less violent in terms of violent crime, you know, since the 1990s, 1980s. I mean, we've been in largely in decline. I think there's been an uptick in violence in the last few years, if I'm, if the statistics I'm seeing are right. But in terms of global peace or percentage of humanity plunged into war, I really don't know on that front. I don't know either. Because we don't do campaign season anymore. So I no. like that. We got football season now. <laughs> really, I think I've told you yeah. before, I think it's meant to scratch that itch and simulate it. You've got artillery, you've got infantry, you've got a phalanx. Uh, you've got defensive maneuvers, you've got strategic retreats, you've got objectives, aerial attacks. Football is just meant to scratch the itch. But man, when we fight, we do go big now. I agree. I agree. I think about that a lot. Uh, you know, you can see things happening on Twitter all the time now in, in conflicts. Twitter seems to want to get me excited by showing me violence yeah. of any kind. It'll yeah, show yeah. me People fighting in a street. Mm -hmm. Oh, this worker was disrespectful to this convenience store customer or whatever. It just really wants me to see fights. And I I don't know if that's a function of what I'm pausing to watch, but um, I don't know. I don't think algorithms are good for us in in that in that way. I I think we need to revisit that as well. Yeah, we do. Man, we're all over the place, dude. I, uh, I'm just happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here in South Dakota. Um, e- even if you're sitting there in that chair with your arms crossed with this huge Scottish claymore at your feet, ready to fa- ready, ready to what? 
I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is I'm going to get in tight. and Yeah, I don't think I could hurt you with this. I don't think you could. No. I, I'd get in there. I could grab a pencil, and I could start jabbing you before you could tornado that thing. Brother, I'm not kidding. If I had to fight you with this, like let's just say that you got bit by a zombie, and you just turned evil all of a sudden, <laughs> and I would hate that. It would break my heart bad, yeah. to have to try to stop your animated corpse. That's the last <laughs> animated corpse I would want to. I mean, it'd be very hard for me. Yeah. But if I had to, <laughs> I don't think I could stop you with this weapon. I think it is too slow and too unwieldy. And I'll tell you this, I would not swing it at you. I'd brace that thing against my hip and I would poke and jab with it to keep you at a distance until I could get to something else other than this stupid thing. I can't swing that. It's huge. Yeah. It looks interesting, though. It, it commands the room. When you walk in here, you're like, oh, Matt's got like his recording set up. Oh, he's done a real good job with the sound treatment in here. There's very few sharp corners in this room. You've got foam everywhere, and then you've got this gigantic sword. <laughs> and then there's that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of commands presence there. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. I think it's interesting to kick this stuff around. You know I'm coming off of a whole bunch of Persia and Rome and all of this. So I have just been down here in this basement that you, that you and I are sitting in thinking about the ancient world and how it was formed and what people did to each other, because the battles were decisive. It's not just about the clever leadership of these kings or their better ideas or superior code of laws. I mean, all of that really matters. But ultimately, it all got put to a test. These civilizations pushed their chips to the middle of the table in pitched, physical, bone-crunching, hand-to-hand, close-proximity combat. And if you lost... Uh, that could be the end of your thing. As, Man, that, that took me to a weird place mentally when you just described battles like that. Because the fact that we are pinned to our physical bodies and those bodies can die, that fact alone changes a lot because certain ideas went out because of that. And I've talked to you about this in, you know, in the past. This, yeah. is a, this is a topic I really think is interesting. But just that fact alone, what if we were in bodies that couldn't die? How would you settle conflict? Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. I suppose the threat would be incarceration. Would you would just go to whatever, you would go to whatever, man, that's, that's an interesting question. Yeah, it all comes back to mortality. But it does, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, and, and you're it's leveraging that, in the ancient clock. world in hand-to-hand combat, you're leveraging our mortality against yours. We're willing to take the risk and meet you in the field of battle. Oh, okay, you've passed the first test. You're willing to meet us in the field of battle as well. Well, let's see what your culture has produced. Let's see what you do when we do this to you. What do you do when we black out the sky with arrows? Do you have the discipline to stand in the face of that? Do you have the technology to stand in the face of that? Oh, you passed that test. You do. Well, that's adorable, Greeks. Well, what do you do when you see cavalry that looks like this, that rides this hard with these amazing... Persian median horses because they're unbelievably fast and they're like nothing you've ever seen before. Do you have the technology for that? Do you have the discipline for that? Do you have the strategy for that? Oh, crap. Okay. Well, you do. Well, do you have the technology to defeat our wicker armor and shields? You do. Okay. This is actually getting much, much worse. Do you have the resolve though to chase us into these bogs before we can get to these ships? Oh, you do. You have the resolve. Go, 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 guys, go. Must go faster. Must. I mean, that's yeah. I, that's a battle marathon. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You know, but it's but it's actual people wielding actual implements like you're seeing here in this office. And the way to walk off the field that day is use an implement in your hand to take the life of other people until their will and resolve breaks and their technology, strategy, culture, and physical conditioning, training, and discipline. It, it either beats yours or it wilts in the face of you. It's just, it's very simple and it's kind of terrifying in its simplicity. And um, I suppose that's part of the reason that I like keeping a couple of these instruments around here because so much of it's come down to that, you know? As we're recording this, there's something really wild going on. The, the offensive, the, the campaigning season, so to speak, is kicking off uh-huh. in the Ukraine. And... Ukraine is starting this massive counteroffensive, and Russia has known this was coming for a long, long time in basically the eastern part of Ukraine. And they're having to do breaching maneuvers, meaning Russia's had a really long time to well prepare a defensive position 
and Ukraine is rolling in with just brigade after brigade. And they're having to try to go across minefields. They're having to do all kinds of stuff with loitering UAV kamikaze drones overhead, artillery that can call in, anti-tank guided missiles being fired at them. They're having to do all these things, and, and the Ukrainians are trying to get basically establish a, a foothold inside those lines, and I, I think they're going to be successful. But what's interesting is it boils down to a, a guy sitting in the front of an infantry fighting vehicle with a bunch of other guys in the back. He's like, all right, guys, it's time to cross the field. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. You know, Slava, you, you know, they, they're getting ready to go. And they, at some point, he hits the gas and he starts moving. It all comes down to that, man. Somebody had to stand up and hold that sword. And they were really willing to do the things that you just described. You know, do you have the resolve? You passed the first test. You passed the second test. It's crazy, man. It's just wild to think about. It's crazy. And Where's, I'm not a coward. I've just never been tested. Step one for me. I'd probably wet myself and, you know, can you imagine being... Just as a function of age? <laughs> can you imagine being in one of those boats, you know, rolling up on D-Day? I and... told you I had a guy tell me about it. No. Our neighbor in Vegas, when we were young, we lived in Vegas. We didn't have any kids yet. Camilla was just pregnant with our oldest. There was a dude next door, old dude, and he was always friendly. He had friendly eyes. And he kind of engaged with me an extra sentence or two when I waved or said hello compared to the other neighbors. And finally, I was just mustered the courage. Be like, hey, is it okay if I ask you a couple questions? What have you done with your life? What have you learned along the way? Would you be willing to share with a stranger? And he sat me down, told me everything that he'd learned, the lessons. That, but uh, he's like, I learned an awful lot in one day. Okay, what day? Well, D-Day. <laughs> oh, June 6th. So you've seen those boats that the soldiers loaded up on. Yeah. Did you know that those made multiple trips? Well, I guess I didn't really think about what they did after they drop off a group. He's like, well, they did. And I captained one of those ships. And it's been long enough now that I don't remember how many trips he successfully made until it got destroyed and he found himself swimming to the beach with a sidearm only and no idea where anybody is from, you know, from his boat, his company. He's just you know, on Utah or Omaha Beach, whatever, wherever he was, he's like, there's just, there was nothing strategically for me to do other than not die. There's nowhere to go. There was nothing to take. I didn't have the weapons necessary to help secure anything. I just tried to not die and help people when I saw people that needed help. How long were you out there? Oh, all day. Yeah, it was, that was all day. Whoa. And he, he knows what an MG-42 machine gun sounds like. I guess he probably does. He probably still knows what that sounds yeah, like. He probably dreams about it. I wish I'd recorded all of that. Wow. I've already forgotten cool things he said, and, and no doubt he's gone now. But people from across the ages have picked up whatever implement they have had to resolve crazy situations. It's wild that most of us haven't. That's wild, man. I, I can't imagine how cool it was to hear that guy. Yeah, it was cool. Seriously, dude, we came in here, we sat down, and I was going to take the first word and start with some stuff about childhood magic oh. and what makes that a thing. Oh, And instead, we talked about savagely slaughtering your enemies with simple implements you can hold in your hand. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, tonally, very similar. Sounds like a normal episode. It's my own dang fault. I put swords in here. <laughs> You're not going to sit in that seat and not see the swords. So we, so we I guess I could swords. have honed in on the little statue snow babies <laughs> up there yeah. next to the new Bible dictionary. But, I mean, something about the sword is just more yeah. compelling than snow babies. It's funny. You went right to the helmet, right to the swords. So, all right. I can respect it. I see what you did. That was fun to, it's fun to game that out a little bit. Fun to think about the, uh, the question of simple implements and what you would use. And I think the idea of a... I think the idea of a short sword makes a ton of sense because what's the best camera? The one you have. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, What kind of Bible should you read? The one you have at the time. That's Yeah, that's it. It all keeps coming back to that kind of stuff, right? There are certain things in your life I didn't return the question. What what are you going to carry? Whatever I can keep with me. Oh, okay. If this were actually something I had to consider, I would need to figure out a way to have it on my person all the time. That's why I'm thinking like a gladius. 
Yeah, I think that's making a lot of sense. You have the advantage here because your thigh is longer than mine. I just do not have long legs. So for me, the idea of carrying something on my hip, I mean, most of the time, if I carry a sword all the time, I'm not going to be fighting people with it. Most of the time, it's just going to be obnoxious and in the way. But if we lived in a reality where you just really need to have a handheld non-gunpowder weapon all the time, yeah, I think I would want a swinging or slicing blade, something like that. It's versatile. It gives you options. But you have to live your life and do things. So I think you've got to take that into account. So I think I would go with some kind of short sword as well. That's why pistols are such a big deal. They can be carried easily all the time. Cool, man. Well, uh, childlike wonder next time around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that would be great. <laughs> it sounds great. We need to mix it up. Snow babies. Yeah, I got a snow baby. <laughs> Just rub it in. Rub it in. <laughs>